This is Newsroom. Hello and welcome from Johannesburg in South Africa. I'm Sam Marshall. This show is live and broadcast from our studios in Auckland Park. We're also streaming live on YouTube with the entire show available on our YouTube channel. We head to Port Elizabeth for the Federal Congress where a leader will be elected after the resignation of Helen Ziller. It's believed that more than 700 women and children have now been saved from Islamist captam- captivity in Nigeria. And in fact, the latest issues, the Global Cannabis March is an annual gathering which seeks to advance cannabis reform. We find out if this is a pipe dream. But first, let's get today's news with Anil Domel. Good morning, I'm Anil Domel. Let's just have a look at the stories making headlines today. In the United Kingdom, British Prime Minister David Cameron is now certain to remain in his office at 10 Downing Street. This as election results are continuing to pour in for the British general election. Voters took to the polls yesterday. The Conservative Party is on course to retain power, while Liberal Democrats suffered heavy defeats after five years in coalition with the Conservatives. Residents of Orlando West and Soweto will have to pay for the amount of electricity they use. Speaking to Morning Live, Eskom's housing manager Bandile Jack said that the utility has always maintained there would not be a fixed rate for the community. This after residents took to the streets in violent protests against prepaid meters. Eskom started installing the meters last year. Residents, however, insist on paying a fixed amount of 400 rand a month for electricity. So it owes the power utility 4 billion rand in unpaid bills. We are clear that a person will pay for what they use, not a flat rate. Yeah. We are very clear. Currently, Leon, we've got about 180,000 customers in, in Soweto. We have installed about 27,000 of these meters in Soweto. We are continuing to install, and we'll continue engaging and installing until we do this and finish. Meanwhile, police are keeping a close watch on developments in Orlando West and Soweto following days of violent protests against prepaid meters. Fifteen people have been arrested. The Springs detective wanted in connection with killing suspects has been arrested. The officer had been on the run since the arrest of his alleged accomplices, a constable and a police informer earlier this week. They appeared in court yesterday on charges of killing three suspects. Their bodies were found on a mine dump near Coltonville in Springs. There's just over 24 hours left before the Democratic Alliance holds its federal elective congress in Port Elizabeth. 21 candidates are contesting for the six leadership positions. Four of the 21 will be competing for the position of federal leader. Today we'll see the party's second highest decision-making body hold its last meeting before the leadership contest takes place. Items on the agenda will include proposals to the current constitution, including that of a creation of a deputy party leader. The federal congress will kick off with a tribute to outgoing DA leader Helen Ziller. And in Lesotho, it's all systems go for the official opening of Parliament by King Lear III today. The opening follows the SADC facilitated election held in February. The vote was brought forward by two years as part of a deal to resolve the kingdom's political crisis last year. Both the National Assembly and Upper House, the Senate, have officially been summoned by the King. Well, remember, you can find all of those stories on our Newsroom Facebook page. Just search for Newsroom. You can also follow us on Twitter at SABC Newsroom. Sam, over to you. Thanks, indeed. Now, South Africa's official opposition party, the Democratic Alliance, will over the weekend hold a crucial Congress in Port Elizabeth to elect new leadership that could redefine the future of the party. The vacancy occurred after party leader Helen Ziller's announcement that she will not make herself available for re-election at the Federal Congress. 
The contest for the party leadership has developed into a four-way contest. Candidates who have put their hands up are DA Federal Chairperson Dr. Walmart James and current parliamentary leader Musima Amane. Ordinary member from Gauteng, Adrian Naidu, and from Northwest is Morgan Olifant. SABC reporter Yulisa Njamela will be attending the Congress and joins us from uh, SABC Port Elizabeth studio. And we'll talk to DA National Spokesperson Pumzile Van Dam. Yulisa, good morning. It's so a very good morning indeed, Sam, from Port Elizabeth, the city that will be hosting the historic and much-anticipated DA Federal Congress. The Windy City, of course, we know that historically this has never happened in terms of two black candidates leading uh, the contest for the top post of the Democratic Alliance. Having spoken to the former DA leader, Tony Leon, a few days ago, he believes that Musi Maimane, of course, as the front runner, has added advantage having been uh, part of the campaign last year for Gauteng Premiership, whereby the DA pumped some millions and also having been endorsed by a couple of leaders, prominent leaders within the party. But not only that, he's a current parliamentary leader, but we have the national spokesperson of the DA to talk to us about the Congress, the Federal Congress that will be starting in just over 24 hours. Pumzi de Fondami, thank you so much for joining us this morning here at SABC. First, the leaders are all here. There's a meeting that will take place a little later today. How are the preparations? Uh, the preparations are well underway. Um, as you said, dear leader Helen Zell is here. The mayor of Cape Town is here. Our parliamentary leader, Musi Maimane, is here. Um, so there's a real exciting buzz in the DA. I mean, not only will we, will we be electing new leaders, we'll be also launching our values charter, which is a series of values that we believe that uh, many South Africans share with us. Um, so today, delegates will start arriving from around the country. Um, the only damper on the mood has been put by uh, the SABC's decision uh, not to broaden broadcast um, our Congress. Um, we believe the SABC is a public broadcaster. It's publicly funded and they have an obligation to make sure that they provide balanced and fair coverage. Well, as you would know, there is a meeting currently between SABC management and the DA leaders. So I suppose we will have to wait for that decision. But getting into the crust of the matter, I put it to you that Musi Maimane is not only the front runner. It would seem like this is a given. This is perhaps a waste of time. You should just as well anoint him because in, a, in, in over just a few hours or rather 24 hours, he will be the DA leader. On your point about uh, the SABC management meeting on the decision to whether or not to broadcast our Congress live, uh, if we do not get a satisfactory answer, we will consider going to court. Uh, I unfortunately cannot speculate about who is going to win this contest. Um, internal elections in the DA are fought hard. Um, candidates uh, campaign vigorously. Um, it is ultimately up to the... 1,400 delegates who, who will be attending the Congress to vote who they think will be the best leader of the DA. Um, it's great that we have so many talented and different leaders of different diversities uh, and talents. Um, so I'm, I'm confident that whoever does win it will be a great candidate who will take this party forward. But surely it has quite disadvantaged the other leader being uh, Wilmot James because Helen Zilla stepped down quite late and therefore they didn't have so much time in terms of campaigning. However, Musi, having such a high profile, had an, ad an added advantage over Wilmot James. Um, Helen Zilla said she took that decision because she didn't want a long and bruising contest. As you have seen, there's been vigorous campaigning. Um, so making it shorter means that there's less time focused on the internal, internal election, that once the election happens, we can focus on the external goals that we have. So these elections always happen, these internal elections, a bit of, you know, vigorous campaigning. But once it's all over, everyone stands behind the new leader and we're united and we take the party forward. It's been quite exciting times, though, for the DA. I mean, different, historic, much anticipated. You've had live debates on, on television. There have also been also, uh, sexual scandals, though. Uh, the anonymous email that was received about a week ago, uh, implying that some of the leaders are involved in sexual impropriety acts. How have you dealt with that? It would seem like the party has just swept, swept it under the carpet. We've absolutely not swept it under the carpet. It's a bit difficult to investigate 
creates an issue when it's anonymous and you don't know who the sender is and you can't find out who that person is. I mean, if there is a person that feels that they were sexually harassed, I strongly encourage them to come forward. Um, we have a sexual harassment policy which is quite clear on what, on you know, not allowing sexual harass harassment. So if there are women that feel this way, I really, really encourage them to come forward. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank it's been a pleasure. And of course, good luck for the Federal Congress, which Thanks. is starting in Thank just you. over 24 hours. Every twist, every turn, the SABC will be bringing it from here in Port Elizabeth, the Windy City. Back to you, Sam, in Johannesburg. Thank you very much. And of course, talking to Pumzile Van Dam, as the SABC uh, report, Yulisa and Jamela, kind of unpacking what's happening in that part of the world for us. As we know, it's the Federal Elective Congress. Uh, they, it's a four-horse um, race, but we have, in many ways, the media been focusing on probably t two of the candidates. That's the most senior profile. That, of course, is parliamentary leader, Musa Mamani, and uh, we're also talking to, of course, uh, Dr. Walmart James. Uh, to unpack the issues for us now from a completely different perspective and to give us insight on how this content has been running and uh, what the leadership might look like at the end of this weekend. We're joined by WITS research consultant uh, Susan Poison. Uh, Mrs. Poison, thank you very much for joining us um, here in the studio. Why is there not a clear favorite? I mean, we've seen the debates. For me, it was a very lackluster attempt. Uh, Musi coming from a very uh, popular um, um, rhetoric where Dr. Wilma James and, and I think how we've touted is one is on merit and one is on popularity. Yes, it's a fascinating contest. In many ways, one wishes these two people could be one candidate. <laughs> that uh, that would be, uh, but then there wouldn't be a contest. One gets an idea it was an arranged contest. Because by all indications, if one looks at the provincial and hitherto delegate endorsements, Musi Maimani seems to be a front runner, yeah. clearly. But then it is a contest that brings better exposure. It brings public uh, publicity to a party obviously is much more interesting and it legitimizes an incoming leadership. If people can look at two candidates and see yes this is the one we want the, whether it's popular reasons or principled reasons and so it has been a fascinating context I think a clear front runner but the contest is it works well in party mm. politics. How much of that? And if you read the comments um, on the various social pages, you on uh, some of the articles where they allow comments, there seems to be um, two just opposed ideas here. That Musima Mane represents the future of the DA. That he's young, he's got the energy, he, he, he brings a sentiment with him, very similar to what we've, and I don't want to pair them together, but what we've seen with the EFF, with a very young Chilis Milema leadership, and there's an opportunity to galvanize and maybe appeal to the black vote that the DA is desperately looking for. And then there is Dr. Wilma James, who comes with his history, this experience, and all of that, but um, in many ways is seen as something from the past. How do we find that perfect blend? Because they're also talking this weekend about a deputy leader. Could we potentially see an experienced deputy leader? Oh, the, well, that is, that is a possibility. But, you know, when we look at black and specifically also black African, if I can use these South African descriptive racial terms, leader, then Musi Maimani really reflects that constituency, that target audience that the DA needs to conquer. It has made small inroads, but only small, and not great momentum there. They figure mm. they've got better momentum on that front if they get a leader that looks like the people they are appealing to. And in politics, that often works. And if it's a person who speaks up more of the popular rhetoric, who makes the sounds that he believes the people out there want to hear, this is the case of Musi Maimani, then it is quite possible that well, yeah, as a good chance to make that gamble work for them. But it will also take very hard work because they still need to consolidate the colored constituency vote that mm. they have, that colored voting block, if you'll excuse my semi-racial terms here. But South Africans work in terms of those voting blocks. Of course, there are always exceptions when one talks voting block, large numbers. But the general thrust is colored people have started voting across class, working class. They generally tend to be very conservative 
conservative, even more conservative here. And, but that still needs to be consolidated. And there, the, that triumvirate of Patricia DeLille, Helen Ziller, and mm. uh, um, Mazibuko did play a big role in bringing that in. But Musi Maimani would still have to consolidate there. William R. James then comes from that kind of ascriptive background. But he is not the person who's going to dance with the folk and sing the popular cultural songs. So the DA and Musi Maimani would only do it with a great push, I think. So he would still have to work very hard to consolidate that constituency. Interestingly, I think white South Africans are more ready to accept that kind of leadership. Let's flip to that debate very quickly. Uh, Wilma James says the party needs to go back to the drawing board on policies. Yes, he said the DA is drifting strategically. It does not know where it is. We are becoming an alternate to uh, the ANC and not an alternative. Your views? Oh, one sees those trends, yes. You know, and, but that is so party politics, and that is these machinations of party politics where political parties, rather than being principled in the first place and um, solidly principled consistently, they look at what would the voters that I want to work over would like me to say. And there I think Musi Maimani has been a great illustration in this campaign of that. He has been so groomed also with last year's national and provincial elections into that speak of what do, the, what do the opinion polls say, what are the people believing and that is what we must say and that is one of the great contradictions and dilemmas that the DA will be facing in the next few years how to remain that more classical liberal party and steadfastly say this is, these are the constitutional principles and we're going no, doing no deviations whatsoever or listening to South Africans can also, like the British, be very conservative and talk in favor of death penalty, etc. And that will, we yeah. saw that coming out in the Maimane and will March debate. debate. Yeah. Are we seeing a, 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 I don't want to use the word fractured, but are we seeing a, a, a party that could be a little divided? We've seen four people tie in for the top position. There are camps within the DA, like people could argue maybe any political party. Mm -hmm. But are, what, what, is the, what is the prediction of this party after this election? Are we going to see, obviously we'll see publicly a united front, but are we seeing now that Helen Ziller has taken herself out of that top spot, maybe a bigger infight between the, in the DA? You know, Helen Zeller with her authoritarian, maybe some people would say it's great leadership, <laughs> but tendencies, she did hold that party together ideologically in terms of policies. She would step in very adamantly when there were any deviations from those policies, and that will be gone. But I think there are long-term stalwarts in the DA back rooms, the JM selves, etc., who could still hold things together very strongly. But let's face it. As political parties grown, grow, and the DA has grown sub substantially, consistently over all of the elections, For especially sure. since 2004, they accumulate a more diverse following. And it is, the DA really has become a mini broad church, like the ANC is a Maxo broad okay. church. So I'm sure we're going to be watching this debate, Prof, with uh, some keen interest. Very quickly, um, we've seen this run-up to the UK election, a completely different picture from what played out at the polls. We were talking co coalition governments. We were already preparing ourselves for some kind of uh, a coalition government. Then David Cameron's Conservative Party is in the majority. We've seen the Liberal uh, Democrats being destroyed at the polls. The Scottish National Party increasing tremendously. Just a reaction from you. Prof. It's fascinating the a conservative shift. Contrary to p opinion polls conducted one week ago, when the British came to the point that they have to choose between a more socialist and a very much more conservative direction, they knew exactly where they wanted to go. And that is a very, very significant result. Professor, we're going to leave it there, but thank you very much for joining us. Political analyst and Wits research consultant, Professor Susan Boyson, talking to us. Before you go, let's just get some reaction quickly from sub-counsel uh, for DSP Now. It says, looking forward to hashtag DA Congress this weekend, seeing old friends and colleagues welcoming new ones and getting fired up by our leaders, hashtag 2016. Some positivity coming out of this meeting, but I can only imagine, Prof, that a lot of people must be deeply, uh, deeply nervous. 
Yes, they are, you know, because these fights can blow up. And so sometimes it's a question of how can the opposition really, really be minimized or is going to be seen as serious challenge because there are next rounds of elections and people take much encouragement of what results they get now. Uh, Josh Jordan says, all right, let's go uh, jump PE, NBA. We are coming for you. Federal Council first, then Congress this weekend. Let's make history. And in many ways, it will redefine the way uh, we are moving for, forward after this me uh, weekend. Beautiful says, you cannot ask the majority to vote on uh, whether to respect human dignity or unpopular groups at hashtag SA debate. And I think this is a reaction to the debate between Musa Amani and uh, Walmart James. We were talking about whether there should be a public referendum or not. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So that are, those are your comments. Thank you very much for taking part. Let's now take a look at the front pages from around the globe, starting in Europe. The Times says David Cameron was heading for another term in Downing Street early today as the election results confirmed a shock exit poll that put him only seven seats short of an overall majority. And also the International New York Times says leading with that story, Prime Minister David Cameron's party appeared to have won 316 seats according to an exit poll, 10 short of the 326 necessary to win an outright majority. And in USA, the U.S. Today says Liberia's plan to declare a nation officially free of Ebola on Saturday, barring the unexpected discovery of a new case. The announcement would come more than a year after the outbreak of the worst Ebola epidemic in history, killing 4,716 in Liberia and infecting twice that number. Let's now take a look at what's happening around the country. Today we start in Johannesburg where Malefi Maile is expected to appear in the magistrate's court today by allegedly defacing the Mahatma Gandhi statue in Johannesburg CBD. And then still in Johannesburg, the Springs detective wanted in connection with the killing of three suspects has been arrested and will appear in court soon. Yesterday one police constable appeared in court on murder charges. Okay, so we take an ad break here on YouTube. You don't go anywhere. and wasps sting a person, they inject a bitterness venom in their skins. We have about three spider species in South Africa that we have to worry about. Right. Uh, button spiders, which include you know, the, the black widow spiders, yeah. your sack spiders, yeah. and, your, and your violent spiders. That venom is in your system, it's in your muscle tissue. Mm. And the more your heart beats, the faster your heart beats, the faster the blood is going to circulate, mm. and consequently it's going to get that venom into your system faster. If you see a snake like this, uh, the best thing to do is to just uh, stay away from it and contact somebody uh, that, that specializes in removing venomous snakes. Join me on Health Talk every Saturday morning between 9 a.m. and 10 a.m. as we unpack current health stories. Welcome back. You watching Newsroom. Thank you for choosing to stay with us now. It's believed that more than 700 women and children have now been saved from Islamist captivity in Nigeria. Nigerian military troops seem to be more victorious than ever in their assault on Boko Haram since the group began its insurgency there in 2009. Now today we are asked, what exactly is Nigeria's government doing? And its military has recently seemed to be doing everything right. Has this been a result of new leadership or the eventual results of hard-working security forces? To give us insights, we are joined from Pretoria by the Executive Director of the African Public Policy and Research Institute, Dr. Uh, Dr. Martin Rupia. Doctor, thank you very much for joining us uh, from Pretoria. It, we're seeing the news reports. It seems that the military action or the intervention is, is working. Is that a sense that you're getting? 
Uh, just maybe small caveat uh, in terms of uh, my representation here uh, is a visiting researcher with uh, UNISA, the University of South Africa, or the Institute of African Re you know, Renaissance Studies. Yeah. Uh, back to the question that you ask, I think there are a number of processes that are coming together at this point. The first one was, of course, the countries around Nigeria who in January this year took the decision uh, during the African Union summit to assist, and this was Cameroon, Niger, and even Benin, yeah. who agreed to deploy forces. The second point, I think, is that uh, the Jonathan administration, after the very good elections that we saw uh, in Nigeria, are determined to hand over, as you say, a terrorist-free country. And, and so there's more effort that has now been put towards uh, you know, freeing the girls. And I think we see now a confinement of the conflict in this you know, Sambisa forest, where we have seen at least more than 2,000 girls, uh, where we had no idea how many had been uh, captured by Boko Haram, who are now being released. Uh, certainly your figure of 700 is the one that has been accounted for, but there are many more that are coming through. And, and so the point is this, I think a number of uh, points are converging uh, to now result in the major scores of, of you know, women and children, uh, even young people that are being released. Doctor, how much of that influence is the fact that there is a new president-elect uh, um, and the influences, the promises that he's made, the positivity that he's brought after peaceful um, elections, um, how much of that is attributed to the, the recent success we are seeing? I think we can also acknowledge that there is a major point in uh, uh, the president-elect, Muhammad Buhari, coming in, who comes from the north, is also Muslim. So he has taken away the point that Boko Haram was beginning to fly before the elections, that this was in fact a conflict around religions, a conflict around faith. And, and with the win by Buhari, we now know, and, 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 and that argument, I think, has been dismissed. A lot of promises made by uh, Mohamed Dubuhari, a lot of uh, Nigerians and maybe uh, other African countries that uh, have direct ties to Nigeria will be watching very, very carefully. Just what kind of pressure will he be on? When we look at uh, Buhari coming into office, we must not forget that he has been there before. 1983-84, he ruled Nigeria before you know, uh, he was uh, you know, actually thrown out. So this is a man who has a track record, uh, a hard disciplinarian uh, in his first term, and we think he is going to repeat even more of that. And uh, the analysts around the way he conducts himself, the way he focuses uh, on discipline and, and working on national issues, we actually think he will certainly begin to do more. There's a lot that's been uh, made uh, last month. Uh, Mohamed Dubari said Nigeria needed the cooperation of other countries to tackle Boko Haram. And you've uh, started this conversation by talking about those relationships with the supporting troops from the other countries, Chad, Benin, uh, and so on. This, this public um, display of wanting to engage in open dialogue, saying that we need help. Many might argue before that uh, the outgoing president was a little bit lackadaisical in, 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 in being this public and asking for this kind of help. I think you are right. On that point, there are, in fact, perhaps two points that we can raise. The first is that the Boko Haram was, in fact, located around, you know, around the Lake Chad district. So it was across the border. It was in Nigeria and elsewhere. And it's important that he brings in the neighboring countries to assist. The second point is that uh, we begin to see you know, a sense that the Nigerian military had perhaps been partly neglected. And... Uh, of you know, the last few months, at least, there's been more resources, more equipment, more focus on training. And, and the evidence of that has been you know, better delivery you know, on the ground. So Buhari, we hope, can continue on those two uh, fronts, uh, regional, better regional integration and cooperation, and also a better resourcing of the Nigerian military itself. 
Obviously, we're very far removed here in South Africa. We're on the southernmost tip of Africa. We see the stories coming out of Nigeria. We hear the success stories. You're on the ground. Just how strong is Boko Haram after the action we've seen over the last couple of weeks? To, to assess the strength of Boko Haram, one that has to look at a number of factors, not necessarily the military weaponry that they are using on the ground. Boko Haram was beginning to tap into the sense of hopelessness and poverty you know, around the society. But it also was beginning to draw in religious and fundamentalist differences. And, and so those issues, I think, have been addressed in the win that we have seen with Boko Haram, with, with uh, Buhari, rather. And so I- increasingly, you are going to see less capacity on the ground by Boko Haram against the Nigerian military or even the other countries uh, which have been fought. Cameroon, Niger have also uh, uh, you know, been fought by Boko Haram. Doctor, my final question, we've run out of time, but let's quickly just reflect very, uh, let's just reflect very quickly on the South Africa and Nigeria relationship. The government here has assured South Africans that its relationship with Nigeria uh, is intact. Just very quickly talk to me, um, your sense? I think the relations have been repaired. They've just gone through you know, a very difficult phase. But I, I see uh, uh, relations you know, strengthening between the two countries. Uh, um, so, so this is the sense that you know, uh, I'm beginning to get. Dr. Martin Rupia, thank you very much for joining us. He's a visiting uh, doctor uh, via um, UNISA. Let's just take a look at your tweets. Please remember to send us your views on Twitter at SABC Newsroom. It comes from Tantane who says, hashtag Orlando West, Klongo. For today, we focus on the court case, but our protest, protest is not going to end. Then uh, Mr. Cuff and Angel says, uh, fam, those people are now attacking businesses, burning property. That's not on. That's from the Orlando West protest that's be- uh, becoming an issue. And then we've got from Nzuduzo who says, Orlando West residents have been protesting against a prepaid system for electricity and demanding a flat rate of a maximum of 400 rand a month. And that's all related to this prepaid meters in that area. And the and today's picture of the day comes from uh, Philip Joe Ramke, who says, one dead in Oklahoma, more storms predicted as Oklahoma City cleans up the damage from multiple tornadoes. Today's tweet of the day comes from Lindy Cosano, who says, she says, cannot see what the problem would be with prepaid electricity meters. Puzzled, better than getting a sky-high bull month in Hashtag Soweto protest. Now let's take a look at what's happening on our newsroom Facebook page today. The families of three men allegedly killed by two police detectives from Springs Police Station say they are living in fear after the incident. The three victims who were allegedly suspects in a case were tortured and shot dead last month. Their bodies dumped in a field. Then protesters burned a man alive in Burundi's capital yesterday saying he was a member of the ruling party's youth wing which had attacked them during their demonstrations against the president's bid for a third term. And Prime Minister David Cameron's conservatives are set to govern Britain for another five years but fell short of a majority and exit polls showed. This result is likely to trigger an in-out European Union membership referendum. You can find all of these stories and more on our news and Facebook page or visit our SABC website at www.sabc.co.za forward slash news. We take an ad break. You don't go anywhere. Welcome to AM News here on SABC News Channel 404. The people who also should be concerned are the people who voted for people of that ilk. South Africa is indeed a unique country. And South Africa has a democracy that is very exceptional. If people want to change the rules, do it properly. Do it within the context of the Rules Committee within Parliament. And when you shout, it doesn't mean people are listening to you. But there is a point of authority that must always prevail. The ANC is very determined we will not allow South Africa's parliament to be dragged down into the mud.
yeah. and we will defend the constitution and parliament. I think our country is really being torn to pieces. And I think that the struggle for liberation didn't take place for people to play the fool like this in our country. That's AM News, daily at 10 a.m. on SABC News. Welcome back. You're watching Newsroom on SABC News. Let's just have a look at the stories making headlines today. In the United Kingdom, British Prime Minister David Cameron is now certain to remain in his office at 10 Downing Street. This as election results are continuing to pour in for the British general election. Voters took to the polls yesterday. The Conservative Party is on course to retain power, whilst the Liberal Democrats suffered heavy defeats after five years in coalition with the Conservatives. Residents of Orlando West and Soweto will have to pay for the amount of electricity they use. Talking to Morning Live, Eskom's Gauteng manager Bandile Jack said that the utility has always maintained there would not be a fixed rate for the community. This after residents took to the streets in violent protests against prepaid meters. And there's just over 24 hours left before the Democratic Alliance holds its federal elective congress in Port Elizabeth. 21 candidates are contesting for the six leadership positions. Four of the 21 will be competing for the position of federal leader. Today we'll see the party's second highest decision-making body hold its last meeting before the leadership contest takes place. Well, remember, you can find all of those stories on our Newsroom Facebook page. Just search for Newsroom. You can also follow us on Twitter at SABC Newsroom. Sam, back to you. Thanks, indeed. Now, the Global Cannabis March is an annual gathering which seeks to advance cannabis reform. In recent times, and legislation of cannabis has been in the spotlight with thousands of people are taking to social media to send through their requests for things they would like to see covered at this year's SONA. The march takes place on the first Saturday of May every year since it began in 1999. Thousands of people have participated in over 800 cities worldwide. This year, the march will take place in Cape Town, and that's tomorrow, and is expected to draw in crowds. We are joined from our studios in Cape Town by Joe Berghout, who is the CEO and founder of Bongalong, and he is also the lead organizer of uh, Cape Town's Cannabis March. Joe, good morning. Thank you very much for joining us here on Newsroom. Uh, we're talking uh, large numbers. What are we expecting at uh, the march tomorrow? Good morning, Sam. Yes, uh, tomorrow morning we're expecting 10,000 people based on our, uh, our results from last year. So we're definitely hoping for quite a big day. Joe, for many for the first time today, we'll hear about the Cannabis March. Give us a brief history. The, the Cannabis March, this is the eighth annual one in Cape Town. Started off by Andre Duplessis years ago, uh, taken over from him by Emil Fisser. And now from last year and this year, I've been the lead organizer on this. It's definitely, definitely now is the time for South Africa to start partaking in these kind of social movements. As, uh, as you can see, general media, mainstream media have all started picking it up. Government started looking at it as well as on a legal level. If you look at the court systems right now, it's even going down there with the Dacha Kapo and the case alongside Schindler's. So it's hitting the media attention, but let's talk about the importance of the march uh, tomorrow in advancing uh, cannabis um, legislation. Well, personally, to me, the march is like your chance to cast your vote. Coming to the march, casting your vote, same as casting a vote. In, in, as one person, it doesn't do much. But if enough people do it, it definitely makes a chance, uh, makes a change. Secondly, coming to the march is to show South Africa how diverse cannabis culture is. We're not simply restricted to the stigmas and dogmas that have been surrounding this plant for years and years now. As well as we have a great opportunity now to show South Africa that 
we're quite a large amount of people. We're not just every one in ten. I'd go and say we're every one in three people. So definitely if you feel that you want to see a change in South Africa for the better, come to the march Saturday morning at 10 a.m. in Cape Town. Let's talk about that change very quickly because there are countries that have decriminalized uh, the use of uh, cannabis. Is South Africa, and we've been going through this debate, is South Africa ready for, for um, cannabis, marijuana, DACA to be uh, decriminalized? Are we ready? I Personally, I believe that we definitely we are ready. You can look at countries like uh, Portugal, for example. They've uh, decriminalized almost all forms of drugs uh, for 10 years now, and the results they had were definitely more positive than negative. As with anything, if we were to legalize it, of course there would be collateral damage, but now the question is you need to start weighing the two options against each other. Has prohibition worked the last 70 years? No, it has not. So it's definitely time to start looking at a new option. And the best one, which we can see by other countries who have done this, is to decriminalize it at least or legalize it and then regulate the sale so that if it is sold, it becomes a beneficial thing to society and not something that is busy taking away from us. Joe, I want to pick up on one point. You said that there would be some collateral damage. If you had to kind of forecast, what would it be? In the case of cannabis, I'm... Currently standing on not sure what the collateral damage would be in that case. Mostly I find people saying that if they legalize, everybody would just run out in the streets and get high all day. <laughs> I doubt this. My question normally is if it legalizes, would you go out tomorrow morning and get high, skip your job, do not earn an income? That's, I believe, yeah, for me personally, I don't see the collateral damage yet. Okay, Joe, Joe, we're going to leave it there, but thank you very much for joining us from our Cape Town studio. That is Joe Burkout, who's the CEO and founder of Bongalong. They've organized a big march tomorrow. In actual fact, it's the eighth uh, Cape Town Cannabis March that will be happening tomorrow. Nearly 10,000 people expect it, maybe a little bit more. Now, issues challenging the growth of aviation in Africa will come under the spotlight during the two-day African Aviation Summit in Dubai this Sunday. This year, the focus will be on changing the perception of aviation after the, a series of international plane accidents that have occurred over the last two years. The panel sessions will also deal with safety and eliminating human error, as well as training and technological upgrades. Joining us now from a Pretoria studio is senior researcher in artificial intelligence applications at the CSIR, Chris Berger, who will shed some light on this year's plans for the South African aviation industry. Uh, sir, thank you much for joining us here in Newsroom. Let's talk about some of those challenges, and I can, um, from a very layman's perspective, they seem to be many. There are many challenges, but uh, statistically it appears that the challenges are being really well addressed. Since the 1930s, the reliability of the aircraft itself has not been a major issue in accidents, but there's a plethora of other factors, including human error at many different levels. There, uh, there's the infamous pilot error, but there's also organizational problems uh, and, and human error on the maintenance side, on the operational side, at air traffic control, and so on. And nevertheless, the safety record is constantly improving. I'm glad you used the, uh, the term perception because we all have the nagging feeling that there has been a huge number of horrible disasters but nevertheless, uh, when one objectively looks at the statistics, it does appear that safety is increasing gradually. And last year was, in fact, the best uh, record in terms of aviation safety in many decades. When the experts are sitting at the table, you're going to be having uh, panel sessions. You'll be talking about some of the issues you mentioned now. But what is the, the global feel around what the avi aviation industry is currently and what it could look like in the future? It's a question that I've spent a lot of time thinking about. I think uh, a distinction that I noticed in the uh, advertising around the summit um, is an unfortunate one, and that is that Africa is being discussed in the context of being a market and uh, I'm with the CSIR. We're obviously a research organization, and there are other uh, institutions, too, that are very much committed to research and development. 
including some private companies and Danel and the universities and so on. And uh, we think that South Africa could be playing a role as a supplier rather than simply as a consumer. So there are several different technologies being developed in South Africa, including things around unmanned aircraft mm -hmm. and also even an automotive engine and a complete uh, light reconnaissance and ground attack aircraft. So there's quite a bit of activity happening in turning South Africa into a supplier rather than a simple consumer. I want to talk about that uh, unmanned uh, aircraft, but I want to just touch on a point very, very quickly. How important is it that we shift from being seen as a market only and not necessarily um, an innovator in this space? Uh, you've mentioned that there's a lot of uh, development that's happening on the ground. We can think back to the military. I mean, one of the best um, 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 helicopters was designed here in South Africa. Why do you think it is that the rest of the world only sees us as an end destination and not as an innovator? I have a long history of international trade in the high technology arena. And I invariably found that it was very, very easy to impress them. And the main reason was that the term Africa doesn't strike them as a a likely origin for high technology. So whenever I traveled in Europe or the U.S. trying to punt the latest great technology that we'd invented, um, I found that they were initially extremely skeptical. And when they, discussed, or when they discovered that we were actually literate and actually capable of doing useful work, um, they were very impressed. So from that point of view, uh, it might actually be easy to, uh, to impress the international industry as a, uh, as a source of innovation and, and great technology. Uh, it is a major industry. It is a major source of revenue potentially, and obviously that would be foreign exchange and it would be very beneficial to our economy. So I think it is something that should be pursued very actively and is being pursued very actively. Um, there are uh, interdepartmental efforts uh, to fund aviation innovation, as I said, within the universities, private industry, and in the CSIR. So it is a priority for government, and it is yielding fruit. Unmanned technology, human error. Are we going to see, and how soon will we see, aircraft that's completely unmanned? It's feasible immediately. Uh, the U.S. Air Force has run daily schedules between the U.S. and Australia for decades. And uh, as you know, many of the wars in the Middle East and elsewhere are being fought remotely from the Western U.S. So it's feasible immediately. I personally think customer acceptance is a very major issue. And as soon as customers become more comfortable with airplanes that decide for themselves, I expect there will be a major move. Uh, the term is a little bit unpredictable, but I would say that the transition will happen gradually, and I would imagine that within 20 years of now, we will have a uh, tremendous amount of automation, even in passenger aircraft. So we're going to leave it there, but thank you very much for joining us. Uh, that's from our Pretoria studio, is the senior researcher in artificial intelligence applications at the CSIR, Chris Berger, who will shed some light on this year's plans for the South African aviation industry. Now, um, we've got a music guest here, but let's quickly look at your comments. This comes from Sputnik, who says, U.S. hashtag Oklahoma governor declares state of emergency amid devastating storms. We saw as part of our bulletin this morning. Another one, some in amazing pictures coming out of Oklahoma from uh, Ruby Lim, who says, more storms headed for Great Plains after tornadoes kill one injured 12 in Oklahoma. And I think we've got one more update for you. Some striking, stunning pictures uh, of that de devastation from one from Janet, who says, Oklahoma at a Gov Mary Fallen surveys tornado damage amid forecast calling for more severe storms over the weekend. Now, our artist today believes music is a God-given talent that should be used to inspire the young and old people who love good music. Her name, she goes by the name of Tiffany Douglas, and she's in studio to perform her new single, Go Low. Tiffany, very quickly, some music fans will see you for the first time this morning. Yeah. Who are you? Oh, well, I'm Tiffany. I herald from Johannesburg. Tiffany the brand. I, my stage name is Tiffany the brand. Um, I'm 26 years of age. Um, I am a pop 
I, I, I aspire to, to be the new Brenda Fassi because we don't have icons anymore. So yeah, that's basically me in a nutshell. Uh, you can find me at, at Tiffany the Brand. Um, follow me at Twitter, um, at Tiffany the Brand, as well as uh, Instagram, at Tiffany the Brand. Okay, so yep. Tiffany Douglas is one of our new icons yes. here in the music <laughs> Remember, Newsroom is broadcast live from our studios here in Auckland Park, Johannesburg, every weekday morning between 9 and 10 a.m. We also stream live on YouTube at that time with a show available on demand on our YouTube channel. This is SABC News. You've been watching Newsroom. We love it in the morning. Say no to xenophobia. And let's play out with Tiffany Douglas. Make, 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 make me want some What up? Me no want no foolishness Twerking mama, you know, you know what the business is Fired up, fired up, ain't no stopping me I pull up in a fire and make a mother Pop it in there Go low, go low, go low, go Go low, go low, go low, go Go low, go low Go low, go, we no one, no foolishness, back it up. Full tank, you know me, me, I be on that Wu-Tang. Windows roll down, smoke got trophy blue vein. Drink it with cups, shot so strong, called propane. Spit it all out of myself in my mouth, cause I don't give a spit fire, man. How dare I not entertain you? What do I have to do to prove that I love you? Hell's Kitchen ain't got the best view But if you come over, I'll serve you the scope like a menu Give you some space like a venue I'm so out of the box, it's Tiffany the brand new Crazy's me, back in the lack with your style so familiar Between the sheets, a diamond and set for your people in the Scalia For Aaliyah, you should feel ya Won't stop till I reach that million Come on, man, I bag that billion on peaking black or black or see What up? Me no one, no foolishness Twerking mama, you know, you know what the business is Fired up, fired up, ain't no stopping me I pull up in that fire and make a mother Pop it in there Go low, go low, go low, go Go low, go low, go low, go Go low, go low, go low, go We no one, no foolishness, back it up Full tank, I'm a rock Beneath the sports bra I don't porn star But I porn star daily Go swipe that Go be back It's crazy But I got that shit Get on the track Look at my face Call it a hit Why in the nose I wanna go ski Bad boy teams Myself in the class With my own got a lock in the keys I would marry myself Like the lord of the rings My precious uh, Make you believe what you see Preach Make you believe it I'm just playing What time is it? It's question